Okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for being with us on a Tuesday evening. Um, we're gonna get started here. I just wanna make a couple of quick um, notes, announcements before we begin. Uh, one is that uh, you are muted, so we can't hear you. We do that to eliminate background noises so that we can hear our speakers, but we encourage you to use the chat function to submit any questions or comments or share any anecdotes, anything you'd like. Um, you should find that at the bottom of the screen, a little chat bubble. You can click on that and then uh, chat to the group. Um, and we'll use that for the Q&A at the end as well. So you can submit questions there and we'll um, keep track of those and, and uh, offer them to our speakers at the end. Um, my name is Sam. I'm the membership manager at Jewish Voice for Peace and I've been working on putting this series together um, called the Spotlight Series where each month uh, we're featuring a different network of members in JVP, uh, and that includes a webinar and a newsletter. And we started it all off this, this uh, month in January with the rabbis. And so I'm really excited. This has been a long time in the making. Um, and the goal here is for this to be um, interesting and exciting, both to fellow rabbis, folks who are in the field, and also people who aren't, who are just curious what kind of questions and, and ideas the rabbis who are in JVP um, are grappling with, the kind of work that they're doing, um, curious about their role and how they see themselves in the movement. So um, hopefully this will touch on those kinds of things. Um, we are carrying on the series next month with the um, artists, and then we'll have health workers and then students, academics, going to go on until June. So we've got a lot coming up. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. It's just jvp.org slash spotlight. Um, and you can check out the, the future offerings. But for now, uh, it's rabbi time. So let's get started. Um, we've got Rabbi Linda Holtzman um, carrying us tonight. And so I'm going to hand it off to you, Linda, to make some introductions. And thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm here in Philadelphia where it's not raining um, and in my home where it's always rabbi time. So it is a pleasure to, um, to be here tonight to introduce all of you to some of the rabbis who are involved with Jewish Ways for Peace and her, who are doing work that uh, for me feels really critical right now. Um, as a rabbi myself, I'm deeply concerned with how do we build Judaism beyond Zionism? How do we take texts, liturgy, history, everything that is so tied up, all well, so tied up with Zionism that we need to untie it, unpack it, look at it from different angles in order to build a Judaism that can really work, that can really be exciting and life-giving and last into the future. At some point, Zionism will stop being such a force in our lives, and then we want a vital Judaism to be there. So the question tonight, among a few other questions that the rabbis on this panel will ask, um, is the question of what might Judaism look like when it's not wrapped up in Zionism? What do we do with all of these problematic texts and rituals? What new approaches are being tried out? What are the challenges? What are the successes? So before um, I, we introduce uh, rabbis, I want to just tell you that there is exciting work being done through JVP, not just among the rabbis, but also with the Chavura Network, which is a, comprised of a group of Chavura of communities around the country that are creating new and interesting and exciting rituals and prayer opportunities and so much learning and so much wonderful social and political justice activity. So I'd like to start with um, a new psalm that was written by Elliot Batsedek, who is a liturgist and a leader in Philadelphia in a, a Chavurah that's called Fringes that often works very closely with the Chavurah that is that I work with. I work with the Tikkun Olam Chavurah and Elliot works with a group called Fringes and this is one of her sharings. Psalm 137. My God, how beautiful it is. It could break open your heart. It broke open my heart the way Jews grieved and mourned for Zion and Jerusalem for 2,000 years. 
we lay down and wept and wept and wept for thee, Zion. And in those words, everything everyone has lost and wept for, we lay down and wept and wept, remembering thee, Zion. And yet, happy shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Happy shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. As if any grief, however vast, however deep, down to the core of the earth and up into the stars, could justify genocide. As if mourning, even thousands of years of mourning, somehow makes just children's bodies broken, dashed, scattered, shattered. What have we become? That we can pretend our need to feel safe, to be safe, justifies colonization, occupation, imprisonment, mass murder. My God, how awful it is, how horrible beyond measure, how it breaks your heart open that weeping for Zion has been swallowed whole by Zionism. If we remember thee, Zion, our memory must stretch back and back to grasp what our ancestors yearned for, to grasp being forced to sing our songs in a strange land while ruled by violent occupiers to grasp the commandment repeated over and over and over that we must be kind and moral and just, for we were strangers once. Only when we dare grasp our full memory can we fully remember Zion, fully remember what we have lost and what we go on losing. And only when we remember what we are losing can we fully weep. By Elliot Batsedek, of the JVP Chavura Network. So back to rabbis. Tonight there will be three rabbis, each sharing what they work that they are doing and important work in the way that they are approaching Judaism today. I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Lucia Pizarro, who is the first Mexican woman ordained as a rabbi in the conservative movement. She's the rabbi at the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute in Hamilton, Ontario. She was born in Mexico City and has lived in the UK, in Israel, Palestine, in the United States, and in Canada. Her current project is to coordinate a series of online spirituality groups in order to connect people all over the world who identify as Jewish and feel isolated because of their views on Palestine. I'm so glad to welcome Lucia Pizarro. Oh, Lucia, it sounds like you are muted. Let me see if I can unmute you or if you can unmute yourself. Yes. There you go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my work at the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute and a little bit about the theology behind living Judaism in solidarity with Palestine. So how do we live Judaism in solidarity with Palestine? The Jewish Liberation Theology Institute emerged from our liberation seders here in Canada. And these uh, liberation seders emerged from my own experience in Jerusalem when I worked for the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, and I spent a lot of time in Palestinian neighborhoods. Uh, and I witnessed uh, many elements of the occupation. And one of the most painful elements of the occupation is the policy of house demolition. Uh, sometimes I was uh, part of uh, groups that resisted the house demolition, and sometimes I witnessed um, demolition of houses of families that I was very close with. And it was heartbreaking. And then I had to go back to my apartment in West Jerusalem where everyone was going about their business completely oblivious to what was going on 10 minutes away from their houses. And it was even worse when I had to celebrate the, the holidays, uh, especially Passover, because we, 
we're supposed to celebrate our own freedom. And how can we celebrate our own freedom when we are imprisoning an entire people? At the time, I thought the least we can do is to mention Palestine, mention that Palestinians exist and that we are oppressing them. But then just mentioning Palestine wasn't enough. When I moved to Canada, uh, we started telling the story of liberation of Palestine during the Seder. We, we have uh, had Seders in um, Palestinian cultural centers in Hamilton and in Toronto. The Palestinian community has opened their, their arms and welcomed us. Um, we, uh, we have now three Seders, one in Toronto, one in uh, London, and one in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. And our Seders commemorate the, the liberation of, the struggle for liberation of Palestine. And we have, uh, we give the opportunity to Palestinians to tell their own story in their own words. Um, I think the theology behind the Seder is uh, very important for uh, Jewish solidarity with Palestine. The Bible opposes consistently uh, oppressing the stranger, and it even uh, requires us to love the stranger as ourselves. And the reason given is that we were strangers in Egypt ourselves, and, and the Haggadah says that we have to see ourselves as if we personally left Egypt. So this, this ritual has given rise to hundreds of liberation failures and liberation Haggadot, starting with Rabbi Arthur West Coast, but there has been uh, hundreds. For example, our own Haggadah is based on the Haggadah of the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. So we're part of a growing movement of, of Jews who are making Palestinian solidarity, a central element of our Jewish identity and our Jewish practice. But what does this mean? What does it mean that a growing number of Jews is making solidarity with Palestine a central element of our identity and our practice? I would like to talk a little bit about the theology of Mark Ellis because he's the only one that has a, a theological framework for Jewish solidarity with Palestine. The, the first step in Mark Ellis' theology is to acknowledge that Judaism has been infected with atrocity. And Mark Ellis uh, witnessed this for the first time during the first intifada when Israel had uh, announced uh, the policy of beatings and breaking bones as a response to the Palestinian uprising that was mostly nonviolent. And what Mark Ellis saw was the Palestinian children lying in beds from which they would not soon leave, some paralyzed for life, others brain dead, existing on antiquated life support equipment. And the violence of the oppression against the Palestinian people has only increased over the years. So after the Gaza massacre in 2014, Mark Ellis uh, writes that we as Jews have embarked on a history of violence, occupation and oppression, especially after the history that we have suffered, is inexcusable. That there are burning children because of our policies of and enablement is inexcusable. So Jewish history is uh, tainted by the suffering that inflicted upon us and by the suffering that we are inflicted, inflicting on others. And history is uh, ritualized. Um, we, we have in the liturgical calendar now, Jom HaShoah, Jom HaTzmaut, so what, what do we do with a history that replaces ethics with atrocity? Mark Ellis has, um, has been diagnosing the end of Jewish ethics uh, for years because of what the state of Israel is doing to Palestinians and because of the unequivocal support of the Jewish establishment in the West 
of this uh, so-called Jewish state. But Markelis, uh, uh, there are a group of Jews that Markelis calls the Jews of conscience. And in the eyes of Markelis, they carry the ethical tradition and the prophetic. In, in a time when the majority of Jews are very comfortable under the protection of state power in, in the West, Jews of conscience are the ones that testify to the humanity of the Palestinians. And they are uh, transforming Judaism. The, the testimony of the Jews of conscience disturbs the silence of the mainstream Jewish establishment when it comes to Palestine. The, all the, the Jewish establishment, the, the policies is to remain silent. Um, this is why Jews of conscience are maligned and persecuted. Mark Ellis sees uh, Jews of conscience slowly walking into exile. This exile is not from Jerusalem, but it's from their families, from the Jewish community that uh, denies their witness and accuses them of, be, of being self-hating Jews and traitors. The Jewish ethical tradition is not dead. The Jewish prophetic is not dead. And of course, this is of no comfort to Palestinians in the, in the cantons in West Bank and in the prison that is Gaza and in the refugee camp, camps. But all in all, we, we don't know what the future will bring. Uh, even the survival of humanity is in question right now. Uh, those of us who have been blessed with awareness we are responsible for reversing the policies that have put the existence of the planet itself in danger. And those of us Jews who are not able to remain silent in the face of atrocity, we are responsible for advancing the cause of justice in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, the, uh, beautiful and powerful. And um, I just want to let re remind people that if you have questions that come up while you're listening to the speakers, we'll um, take, be able to take some questions. Uh, for They'll be able to take some questions after all three, three rabbis have spoken. So just write them in the chat and we'll make sure that um, if, as many as there are time for, we will, we will um, make sure they get asked. Uh, second, our next speaker is Rabbi Jessica Rosenberg. Jessica is a reconstructionist rabbi born, raised, and based in Philadelphia and the surrounding suburbs. She became a rabbi to learn our people's diverse and nuanced histories and create spaces, ritual, and organizing that helps transform our relationship to past, present, and future. I present Rabbi Jessica Rosenberg. Thank you so much, Linda. We will also make you answer questions as you have been doing this work for many years. Um, and thank you so much, Lucia. Um, I want to also thank Rabbi Lori, who's not on tonight, but was a big part of organizing this. Um, I'm just, I'm really excited to have the space to talk about this because for as long as I've been in JVP, um, I think this might be the first like real, we're going to talk about Judaism beyond Zionism. Um, and that is so necessary and exciting. Um, and just to acknowledge that many of us are already living Judaism beyond Zionism. There are people here on this call who have been making seders like how Lucia described for decades and writing new liturgy and rediscovering old songs and um, really bringing this through us already. And I think part of our task right now is to harvest the frameworks and theories and understandings and practices from what we're already doing and name it and share them with each other. So a little bit about um, my journey here um, and uh, some awakening moments for me on this Judaism Beyond Zionism journey. Um, so getting politicized on Palestine was really the beginning of my adult relationship with Judaism. 
um, in my early 20s as I got involved with Palestine Solidarity Organizing. It was also when I started to pray every day, to go to synagogue multiple times a week, and to make Shabbat. Um, and this was related that as I was doing um, this like really heart and gut-wrenching organizing, I needed a spiritual foundation for that work. Um, and as I was doing that, the education that I was getting about Zionism taught me that it was a 19th and 20th century political movement modeled on European nationalisms and the and colonial projects in um, Africa and the Americas. Um, and that Zionism was really just a cynical answer to the Jewish question in Europe. Learning about that and the occupation of Palestine and the current realities in Palestine while I was coming into daily Jewish practice made for just all of these heartbreaking moments that I know many people on this call have experienced all of these places where it seemed like Zionism had really corrupted Judaism and Jewish practice all of the kind of next year in Jerusalem moments all across the liturgy. And one of the hardest moments for me was in synagogue when it was time to say the Amidah, the central prayer, and everyone turns and faces east to face Jerusalem. And I have memories of very awkward moments in leftist or JVP prayer spaces where we would kind of like hold our breath and like, would we turn or not? Which direction? Um, and I also have moments of being in mainstream Jewish spaces and just kind of refusing to turn and everybody would turn and face this way. And if I was like, happened to be not, I would just not move and I would just like stand and face the room full of people and feel like really okay I'm not turning to face Jerusalem and this was like a stand I was taking a literal stand I was taking um, then my first year in rabbinical school we were studying the foundations of Jewish prayer and I read um, and actually I made a source sheet for us if we want to go later and study Talmud Bavli Brachot 30a part of the um, Gemara that says one who is standing in prayer in the diaspora should focus one's heart toward Eretz Israel, as it is stated, and they shall pray to you by way of their land. So the Talmud was redacted in the sixth century or so, long before modern political Zionism, and they're talking about being in diaspora and facing Eretz Israel. And I remember having this moment of panic, and then it feeling very obvious um, and having, I've, since then I've had a lot of more of these uncomfortable moments of real talk about the way Jews throughout time have had a relationship with the land they called Eretz Israel and a relationship to Judaism long before modern Zionism. And for those of us on the call, most of us have spent some time with Jewish texts and liturgy and history. And honestly, I think it's like the best kept, worst kept secret in anti-Zionist Jewish life that we like never quite talk about head on, that there is a relationship in our text, pre-modern Zionism relationship to the land. Um, and so one of the things I really would love part of this call to be um, having an honest conversation about, um, about that. And why I think that's important, I think that erasing or ignoring Jewish relationship to the land dilutes our relationship to Judaism. It like leaves out a lot of Jewish text and history and tradition. It weakens our ability to really challenge Zionism on its own terms. And really importantly, it erases Mizrahi histories, cultures, and lives if we pretend that the only relationship to the land is a European colonial one. Just erases a lot of centuries of actual Jewish life in the land. So I really, it's like heart racing to talk about this in a public JVP forum, honestly, um, but I'm very excited to do it. Um, so one of the questions that Sam posed to us Hi. about um, in prepping for this was, what are the most challenging moments in the melding of Judaism and Zionism? And to me, that sort of read like, what were the challenging places where Zionism has co-opted Judaism, where it's taken something and then one thing and had it mean another? But for me, the hardest part of the melding of Judaism and Zionism are the places where in our text and tradition and ritual, there is actually a sacred relationship to that land. Like we have very old instructions to turn and face that way. We have prayers for the rebuilding of the temple from long before Herzl. We have all of these holidays that are based on the weather and the seasons and the planting and harvest cycle there. The rituals about death and burial also really based on the weather there. 
Um, and that is the part that I actually feel like the most um, what to do with, like the most needing of comradeship in this community to think and talk about what to do with that. So just to say like what I do with that, I believe that we can have a sacred relationship to that land without taking our mytho history as modern land deed. I believe I can honor my ancestors' relationship to that land without equating it to contemporary political realities. And I believe that I can honor Jewish relationship to the land as an anti-Zionist in part because of the sacredness of that place um, is part of why a modern militarized nation state, I think, is such a desecration of the land and of my sacred relationship to it. I think there is so much work, and um, Linda, in the piece of liturgy that you read from Elliot, you see her starting to do this work of unpacking what our ancestors' relationship, what they meant when they were longing for Zion. Like, what, like, what did that mean to them? Um, before the advent of modern nation states? How do we understand that? So um, I want to zoom back and say that I think all of this anti-Zionist Jewish community building, to me, there's a Venn diagram of Palestine solidarity organizing and Jewish anti-Zionist community building. I think that anti-Zionist Judaism can be one tool in Palestine solidarity organizing, but it is not the same to me. Um, I think there's two differences, or there's two differences that I hold really key. One is about material needs that uh, I want there to be more uh, safety, medical equipment, water rights, like the lived lives of Palestinian people, um, the material needs and the great atrocities that are happening in Palestine. I, I don't actually believe that like my anti-Zionist prayers and my anti-Zionist Tubishvat Seder will affect that unless we also make that Tu Bishvat Seder a fundraiser for organizing and solidarity for justice in Palestine, which, you know, is great. We should do that when possible. Um, I also think the accountability relationships are really different, that in Palestinian freedom and liberation and self-determination uh, movements must center and be led by Palestinians. And anti-Zionist Jewish community building and culture building is, I, I think if we're honest, or I, I think is by and for Jews. Um, and uh, I think it's really important for anti-Zionist Jews to be honest about which we're doing at what time. Um, and I also think it's really important for me as, an, as somebody building anti-Zionist Jewish culture and community to really like keep involved in Palestine solidarity organizing um, because that is where Zionism's real-time impact on real people is playing out. Um, I want to address I think like one discussion I've had in a lot of um, leftist spaces building Judaism beyond Zionism is about not wanting to recenter Zionism in Israel by making all of our Jewish life fully focused on um, anti-Zionism in Israel. So on one hand, I actually really resonate with that idea that like we are in diaspora and want to be where we are and struggling with the political realities in our place and not always be turning to face east. On the other hand, I think there's no standing still on a moving train and Judaism is currently being weaponized in a militarized occupation. And as long as it's happening, that impacts our Judaism and we need to be confronting it. And on the other other hand, I do really believe that like um, part of anti-Zionist Jewish life needs to be also uh, understanding ourselves as settlers in the place where we are and taking responsibility, making reparations and supporting indigenous sovereignty struggles in all the places where we are. So we are, have plenty of work to do. Um, can I take one or two more minutes, one more minute? No, I can stop. I'll stop. I can stop there. Um, I have uh, obviously I could go on about this for a long time, but um, I want to respect our other speakers times and read all of your chats. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry to have to cut you off. Everybody. I mean, all of you, like we have this amazing panel of people who could talk and be fascinating for a really long time. Um, so th thank you for um, bringing a lot and really good, uh, just such powerful, personal, important material. 
and then uh, recognizing that we need to move on. <laughs> so the third person on our panel is Rabbi Brant Rosen. Uh, Brant is a Reconstructionist rabbi. He is the founder of a non-Zionist congregation, Sedek Chicago, and the co-founder of the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council. Most recently, he was the Midwestern Regional Director of the American Friends Service Committee. He is the author of the book, Wrestling in the Daylight, A Rabbi's Path to Palestinian Solidarity. I bring you Rabbi Brant Rosen. Thank you, Linda. Um, and boy, uh, thank you, Jessica and Lucia. Um, I'm, my, my mind is, uh, is just spinning after hearing from both of you. Um, and there's so much I, I want to say now that I hadn't prepared, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do my best to go back uh, to my original, <laughs> my original comments and hopefully we'll be able to unpack all of uh, what we're laying before you during the conversation. Um, so uh, by way of introduction, um, I also want to, to mention that before I uh, started working in my current a congregation, uh, and before I was at the American Friends Service Committee, I served a, a largest Reconstructionist congregation in Evanston, Illinois, for about 16 years. And um, during that time, my own relationship to to Israel uh, really evolved. Um, Zionism, labor Zionism, progressive Zionism, was always a very much a core of my Jewish identity for my entire life. But um, it during uh, the last 10 years or so of my tenure at uh, my congregation, JRC, I really broke with Zionism in a pretty public way uh, and moved from what I would say is, is being a progressive Zionist to being a Palestine solidarity activist um, and getting more increasingly involved in Jewish Voice for Peace. And what was fascinating, none of this was strategic. <laughs> it just kind of happened. Nobody planned for it to happen. And, but one of the things I found was, uh, to my delight, was that my congregation really um, worked, wanted to work with me to figure out how, to, how I could continue to be the rabbi. And I always had the, the support of my board, even though many of the things I was saying and doing and writing were very painful for them. Um, and, um, uh, uh, hang Hang on one sec, I'm just gonna tell someone to uh, keep it down a little bit. I could start talking again, just kidding. Yeah, I'm just gonna remind people that when Brant is finished, we're gonna have time for Q&A. Um, uh, or we can just give the three of you the opportunity to go back and um, share what you haven't managed to share so far, but there are lots of great comments already coming up in the chat. So keep I, adding them. I'm happy to go right to the chat if people would like to. No, 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 no. I said after you were finished, I was talking. Um, so one of the things I found was that it was really impossible for me to continue to be the rabbi of a congregation that had um, members who ranged from Zionist to non-Zionist to anti-Zionist. I think the preponderance of them were Zionist, but to have a rabbi who was such a public, publicly identified figure as an anti-Zionist became untenable. And it's fascinating to me because the opposite is not true. In many congregations, there are rabbis who are very uh, publicly identified as Zionists, whether they're involved in APAC or J Street or JNF, and that's not a problem. It's assumed that that is acceptable. Um, but to break with Zionism was seen as really untenable and unsustainable. And I think that speaks to the real hegemony that Zionism has over Jewish tradition um, and has had in so many ways that we don't even really stop to unpack. So when I left the congregation, I didn't think I'd be able to work as a congregational rabbi anymore. I didn't um, know that there was a congregation who would hire me. Um, I'm not sure I, what kind of a rabbi I would be. Uh, but I, when we started SEDEC Chicago, it was really as a side project uh, for a group of us who wanted a place to be Jewish. Um, and when we started the congregation, we were avowedly non-Zionist. We wanted to make that very clear in our, in our core value statement. And 
if you look at our core value statement, which is quite extensive, one of the categories is uh, Judaism beyond nationalism. And we state very clearly um, that we are a non-Zionist congregation and we do not celebrate the fusing of uh, political nationalism with Jewish sacred tradition. And what that meant specifically, I, at that time, I could not have been able to tell you. We were really building something out of whole cloth that um, we had no real um, strategy for, other than we knew what our values were. We knew what the broad foundation of the community would be, but what the specifics were um, it was not quite clear to us at the beginning. You know, when people would ask us, well, what is a non-Zionist Shabbat service like? Um, and, you know, that's not, it's not on the outset an easy question to answer, um, but I have some thoughts that now that I've been doing this for five years and I've just recently gone to full time in the congregation, I do have some answers to that. Uh, and the, the first answer, I want to, I want to um, go back to something that Lucia said when she talked about Mark Ellis's work, which I think is enormously important. And Mark Ellis in his, he's a very prolific author, but one of his books, probably his best known book is called uh, Jewish, a theology of Jewish liberation, toward a theology of Jewish liberation. And he uh, devotes a significant part of that book to unpacking the so-called Holocaust theologians. These were the theologians, uh, people like Emil Fackenheim and Richard Rubinstein, um, to uh, Irving Greenberg, uh, to some extent Elie Wiesel, who really grappled with where is God after the Holocaust. And um, a a central theme in their work was this notion that the establishment of the state of Israel in the wake of the Holocaust was a redemptive moment in Jewish history. And they were giving voice to something very, very real in, Jew in Jewish life. And that, that, that notion, that redemptive aspect of, of, of Jewish history is completely interwoven throughout Jewish tradition and, and certainly throughout uh, Jewish tefillah, Jewish prayer, um, in ways that we don't often stop to unpack. I mean, in some ways, that's very obvious. There are Israeli flags on the bima in, in many, many synagogues throughout the United States. Uh, usually it's an Israeli flag on one side, an American flag on the other. Uh, we could do a whole session on the concept of bowing down to flags, not only facing east, as Jessica was talking about, but actually bowing down to the flags right next to the Aron Kodesh. Um, there are other obvious ways that most, most congregations include the prayer for the state of Israel. Um, they include holidays like Yom HaTzma'ut, uh, Israeli Independence Day, Yom HaShoah, uh, Yom HaZikaron, Israel Memorial Day, as part of their sacred calendar. Uh, and those holidays were established very, very purposefully by the, by the, Israeli, the early Israeli government um, for be, as a way of acting out that redemptive theology that, that the Holocaust theologians were, were lifting up. Um, that, that we have Yom HaShoah, then we have Yom HaZikaron, and then we have Yom HaTzma'ut. It is that playing out, that liturgical playing out of, of Israel, the redemption of the birth of Israel uh, as sacred holiday. And it's not only civil holiday in Israel, it is really in most synagogues around the country still um, is a part of the regular worship calendar. There are also lots of little ways. You know, one way that um, I, I noticed without even real, I, I've been praying this prayer for so long and I never really noticed uh, what was going on. There's a, a prayer in the evening, uh, evening prayer, Ahavat Olam, uh, which comes <clears throat> as part of the, the block of prayers that's built around the Shema. And it ends with, um, the Havienu Lishalomi Abakan Fota Aretz, to that it's the concept of ingathering of the exiles from the four corners of the world. And the worshiper is supposed to gather the four seat seat together um, while they are praying these prayers uh, at, in a, as we lead into the Shema. And in many congregations, um, including one I davened in fairly regularly, the, uh, the Kibbutz Galiot section of that prayer is sung to the, to the melody of Hatikva. Uh, and 
it came so naturally to me that I never really stopped to realize that that was a very conscious effort to superimpose this Holocaust theology, this redemptive Israel narrative uh, in a very real way into Jewish prayer, into tefillah. So, you know, as I started to, as I, we started to contemplate what tefillah would be like um, uh, in a non-Zionist setting, I think the first step is to really um, face honestly and unpack seriously the ways that hegemony has become so deeply ingrained in ways that are obvious and ways that are not so obvious. Um, and I will say that one of the things I've noticed over the last five years, we've done lots of creative liturgy. We've, um, uh, I've become a, um, a liturgist <laughs> in my middle age in ways that I never expected I would. I think most of the writing I do these days is, is writing of prayers and poetry um, for use in our services. But even more than that, one of the things I found um, in building this congregation is that the most important answer to the question, what is a non-Zionist Shabbat service like, is it's just the people that are there. Um, what we say is very important and on grappling with the issues that I've been talking about is, is, uh, is enormously important and part of this work. But it's really about creating a context for people who um, don't feel comfortable or welcome in other synagogue settings because of that Zionist hegemony that um, for some people it was for some people in our congregation they are coming to services for the very first time because it was just impossible for them to uh, uh, to relate to Jewish prayer and for others like myself uh, who have evolved on this issue um, and are really struggling with um, the way these prayers are contextualized just having a place where there are others around us that we, we can be a community for each other and struggling over these issues together is an enormously important thing. I just want to say one final thing, one final lesson that I, a uh, very important lesson that I learned um, in building this congregation. And, and that is, and this goes to something that uh, Jessica was alluding to when she talked about um, the ways that the land of Israel is, has, was very, very important in Jewish tradition uh, prior to the rise of Zionism. And um, do we want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you, if you pardon the expression? Or if not, how do we recontextualize Eretz Yisrael um, post-Zionism in a way that makes sense? Or is it possible to do that? Um, and I think part of the answer for me is to go, we, we have to go backwards and forwards at the same time. We have to go backwards and reclaim some of the things that were lost with the onset of Zionism as the normalization of Zionism in Jewish tradition. But then we have to experiment and, and think of new ways to go forward because the 21st century world in which we live is radically different from the, the, the world that the rabbis were responding to when uh, Jewish tradition and Jewish liturgy was, was developed. Um, and one of those, one of those um, areas that I've been thinking a great deal about is the concept of Olam Haba and, and messianism in general. And, you know, I'm sure most of you on this call know that, anti, that ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists, a very important aspect of um, their opposition to Zionism is the fact that uh, the Jewish state cannot be established until Moshiach, until the Messiah comes. Um, I, don't, I don't share that theology, um, but I think there's something very, very powerful about the notion that we don't force history's hand and that there's a power yet greater than military power, than political power, um, and that, that Zionism's veneration of pol political and military power has been a betrayal. Um, and that when we imagine Olam Haba, the world to come, the world that we're, we're struggling for, um, it is a world in which we understand uh, the limits of human power and, and um, uh, create the world in which the, the, power, the, the power of goodness, the power of justice uh, is, is, is the power that holds sway over our lives and over our world. And I think in, at SEDEC, we, we realize that because so many of us and members of our congregation are, are organizers and activists and involved in various movements for justice, um, they're very familiar with the notion of, of struggling for the, for the world that we want to see, um, what I would call Olam Haba. 
And that when we get together on Shabbat, that's a time to cease the struggle. That's a time to the milacha, the work of the week, if you will, um, and to give ourselves a taste of that world that we're struggling for. Uh, I think our congregation serves a very real purpose in, in that regard. Um, and, and I think this new kind of understanding of Judaism is emerging kind of organically out of the work that we're doing, that we look at Shabbat as a time to replenish and renew ourselves for the struggle of the week ahead. Uh, and um, understanding that Olam Haba is um, a, a central thread of Jewish tradition that is, is so important um, and in many ways flies in the face of what, uh, what the, the, the Israel as redemptive narrative uh, has been putting before us, I think, is, is part of the answer for us as well. So I'll so, stop there yeah, um, and yeah. uh, I look forward to the conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you all. Um, and so many, so many good questions have come up. I want to just ask Samantha to pose one of them. Thank you. Well, I have. There's a couple of general questions, but there was just one really specific to what you were saying, Brant, that uh, about saying a bit more about Allah Haba. Do you mean? Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Allah, um, so, the world to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take take a moment on that, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we, yeah. There are, um, in rabbinic ideology, in rabbinic theology, there is this notion of um, the world to come. And so much of the what we do in this world uh, is a preparation for uh, entering the world to come. It's a little bit different, but related to the notion of the messianic, uh, era, uh, you know, it is a uh, it is a uh, a vision of uh, of a future, a better future, a more uh, a more perfect future beyond the the pain and the struggle and the reality of the world in which we live. And so, for the rabbis, halacha and Jewish tradition in general was a way of um, of bringing a taste of that world that we're that we are praying for and I would say struggling for into the world to keep us going at, uh, uh, while we work for that world. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm presenting that as a model for understanding the way um, a, a non-Zionist uh, theology or a non-Zionist practice uh, might work for us. That um, I, I think the notion that um, Zion Zionism came to say, okay, history, we are forcing the, the, uh, the hand of history. Redemption is now. Um, we're saying, no, we're not there yet. Um, and Jewish tradition is a means uh, of, of a roadmap for us to, to create that world. So that opens up um, questions that someone asked about um, it, just practically, what does it mean to, um, what kinds of actual things are you doing? Um, and I'd like to open this to Lucia and to Jessica and to, and to you, Brant, um, for all three of you to talk about the practical ways that you think we can really, right now, today, work on building a, um, a, a Judaism beyond Zionism. Um, so how about if we just move back to Lucia or Jessica, whichever one of you would want to talk about what you see happening and what you'd like to see happening and what you're making happen. Um, and then move, move to Brant also. I, well, just very quickly, what, uh, what we do is um, we, we don't like celebrating Jewish holidays as we ignore what's happening today. So we, um, we always, um, our Jewish holidays are aware, are, are being aware, are, are basically celebrated in, in solidarity with Palestine. So we, we really have to um, think really hard how to do that. Uh, we do the, the Hanukkah, uh, parties to raise funds to bring light to Gaza, for example. Um, we do, um, uh, and in the, the Seders, for example, the Seders, I, I always uh, figure which Palestinian uh, 
commemoration is closest to the day is usually either Prisoner's Day or Land Day, so that the theme of the Seder is either Prisoner's Day or Land Day. Uh, so that's that's a, a practical thing that we do for for the community here. Um, yeah, great question. I want to um, pick up, I think what Brand said about like looking to the past and the future while building the future. Um, and also someone, I won't be able to find it in the chat, but someone in the chat pointed out like Reconstructionist Judaism, Reform Judaism. Really, I, wa I want to say that like the project of making Judaism and Jewish life and ritual and tradition in line with our ethical, moral values and in line with our, with the political realities of our moment has been the project of Judaism evolving over centuries. Like that's happened lots of times. And so while the content of what we're doing is new, the strategies I think are actually are, are old and we can learn from previous movements um, and Jewish time periods about like how to do it. Uh, so I, I would just lay out kind of, I, I think there's, um, there's throwing out stuff that doesn't work anymore. I think saying like Yom HaZikaron, um, Yom HaTzma'ud are just not, I mean, that's like literally Israeli Independence Day not present on my Jewish calendar. Um, oh, and I guess to say literally, I am part of making a radical Jewish calendar. That's like one project that in very much actually in this vein, wanting to have like a tactile thing of like, what does it feel like to have Judaism beyond Zionism? Um, is part of part of it for me was like making a calendar to be able to use that wouldn't have Zionist holidays on it. Um, so on that, literally, we leave some stuff off. Um, we put in new things. There's new holidays like um, or commemorations needing to mark the beginning of the first and second Intifada. The first JDP uh, action was on the calendar this year that those are part of our holidays. Um, I think there's also the strategy of like changing the meaning of like reconstructing of like, you know, saying we're marking Purim this year and also we are going to reinterpret, have a Purim celebration that um, wrestles with the topics rather and makes it relevant, tells the story in a way that's relevant to our time. Um, and then I think there's stuff that like we are just going to wrestle with and hope that then, you know, people who come after us figure out even more what to do. Um, so I think, but that's like, we get to to live our Jewish lives and try things on and also just to say like what you do one year like it can be dynamic and changing and I think there's some practices that we don't really know how it feels until we try it and do it and feel like how does the you know can we um, say this prayer and have it mean a different thing uh, you don't always know until you try it like how the words literally like feel in in your mouth so I think like experimenting immersing yourself in Jewish life I mean, obviously, I'm a rabbi. I'm trying to get everybody to immerse themselves in Jewish life, but you know, um, and and like trying things on and experimenting with making the meaning. Yeah, the only thing I would add, um, you know, going back to the uh, the troika of Yom Hashoah, Yom Hatzmaut, Yom Hazik, or Yom Hazikaron, Yom Hatzmaut. Yeah, just um, translate those for one second. So, well, I'll, I'll just go back to Yom HaShoah, which is generally you know, the Holocaust Memorial Day that was established by Israel, but that was done in the context of Israel rising out of the, the, the tragedy of uh, the redemptive rise of Israel out of the tragedy of the Holocaust. One way <clears throat> um, that we can move forward into creating this new uh, Judaism is to think of alternate ways to, to separate ourselves from, from that narrative. And I just want to put in a plug that International Holocaust Day is next week, January 27th, and there are congregations in Jewish communities that are um, choosing to commemorate the Shoah on that day uh, rather than in April. So that's one, one piece. I, I think what Lucia was saying about um, taking Palestine solidarity as a sacred act is, is really what we are finding in my congregation uh, as uh, what this new Judaism look, will look like. So there are so many different ways. Rather than celebrate Yom Hatzmaut as uh, a joyous day of, of independence, it's a day of reckoning about the Nakba. Uh, it's not the same as Nakba Day for Palestinians. That's a very specific day for the Palestinian community. But if we take our role in uh, uh, the Nakba seriously as as Jews, uh, what 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 
what might that look like? And uh, for us, that's meant reading testimonies of Palestinian families um, and, and hearing their family stories on that day, for instance. Um, before Passover, we had Omar Barghouti speak to our congregation um, about BDS and liberation. He spoke to us the day before. He was very important. Omar Barghouti is one of the founders of the BDS movement. Uh, he's been wanting to speak at a synagogue for a very long time, and it was a real honor to be able to give him that opportunity and to do that in the context of moving into Passover and having a conversation with him about the meaning of Passover in the context of BDS was a very powerful thing. So those are just a few examples of, um, I could go on and on, um, talking about uh, Palestinian Gazans who were killed at the Great March of Return during the martyrology section of Yom, Yom Kippur. These are all ways that we are taking our Palestine solidarity seriously as Jews, as, as uh, part of our sacred, lifting up our sacred tradition. Yeah, it's really interesting because when you look at almost any of the Jewish holidays that we have set ways of, of commemorating, and you think with a lens of uh, supporting the Palestinian community, honoring the Palestinian community, owning where, what the Jewish community and the is, is Israeli community have been to the Palestinian community, um, you transform every single ritual for every single holiday so easily. It's extraordinary. Um, so I love the examples that you were given. They feel so important. Um, so it is, it is 8.56, which means we have a very few minutes. So I just want to give the three of you an opportunity um, to say some final words. And the first person who wrote on chat talk, talked a little bit about the challenges of, you, of prophetic stance and being um, out there um, with a, a strong prophetic voice and softening and having dialogue um, both within the Jewish community and beyond and the challenges of both, of doing that blend. And I'm curious for all the three of you as rabbis um, where those challenges lie. Um, and then also if you have any final words that you would like to, to say and in any order that you would like to speak. I'll go first again. Okay. I'm, the, the issue that I have with the soft, softer approach that uh, Robert was uh, mentioning is that it's, it's a little bit what Brandt was talking about, which is an inability to, to stomach silence. Uh, of the of the Jewish establishment, so I personally cannot physically do it. I I could throw up, although I did do six years of rabbinical school, but um, it, it was very hard. Uh, so that's that's the problem. How how for me personally, how do I live with myself and keep silent? Uh, especially precisely going back to the Holocaust. The history has taught us that being silent means that you're a, a complicit in the crime. So we're supposed to learn that from history. And, and what do we do? Well, we are silent because it's a controversial topic. And maybe, you know, we're going to make people uncomfortable. Uh, so that's, that's my issue with the uh, so, but I'm sure that uh, there is a job for everyone uh, in this world, and, and I'm sure that some people should do that, uh, but not, not me. <laughs> I'm so grateful that not you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jessica or Brant? Jessica, do you want to go? I'm... Sure. Um... Yeah, I think I feel very full. Um, I, I think that just the thing I would say in closing is that Judaism is Jewish life is so old and rich and varied and diverse. And um, there are parts of when we like dig into the tradition, there will be even more parts that upset us and there will be uh, thrilling homecomings for our hearts. Um, I, I, I love Judaism is older than capitalism and white supremacy. Um, it's not older than patriarchy and militarism and xenophobia. Um, but I do think that like there are places in tradition that 
uh, can really feed us while we do also heartbreaking uh, work. So I feel honored. I just feel really honored to be in it with all of you for all of our lifetimes and then some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Brent. Just say very briefly, thank you, Jessica and Lucia. Um, you know, we're, we're, I think to be a Jew has always been, you're defined by the local community where you hang your hat. You know, we have a concept of Am Yisrael, you know, and Amcha, the, the Jewish people writ large, which is this mythic notion. But the reality is that we are a wide and varied people. Um, and uh, I think that's the case with this new Jewish community that we're trying to build. It's a new way of being Jewish, but that's always been the case in, in the Jewish world. Um, the one difference I would say right now is that we are living in a political moment where um, there is a, a Jewish establishment that is uh, making common cause with a greater political establishment to demonize and criminalize Jews who stand in solidarity with Palestinians. Literally, uh, we are finding that um, promoting BDS is increasingly uh, a criminal act. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there may be political forces that seek to define it as a form of domestic terrorism. Um, so for those of us for whom BDS is a sacred act of responding uh, to the voice of the oppressed, um, it's not just a question that we're, we're creating our own Judaism in our corner of the world, but we are um, up against forces that are um, seeking to demonize us and criminalize us in very unprecedented ways. And I think um, rather than constantly being played on, put on the defensive uh, and fighting off these accusations, it, which is exhausting, which is important, but exhausting, I think one of the best ways we can respond is to create this Judaism in a loud and proud way. Um, and to not just be defensive and say, no, we're not anti-Semitic. No, we're not self-hating. No, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. I'm not gonna write another article about that. <laughs> Rather, I would rather create a joyous new form of Judaism that embodies all of the values that we've been talking about. And I think that's the best possible rejoinder uh, to the division that we're seeing in, in the Jewish world and in the world in general today. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you, to Lucia and to Jessica and to Brandt. You were all extraordinary and it's so wonderful to learn from the three of you this should be at least a day-long seminar um, thank you thank you thank you um, in conclusion before I um, aim this to Samantha who will um, do the very end I want to just say that if you are interested in connecting with the rabbinic council the best way to do that is to email our um, fierce um, staff person and wonderful staff person, Alana Lehrman, who can be reached at alana.lehrman at jewishvoiceforpeace.org and who would love to hear from everybody. Um, if you are interested in the Chavura Network, uh, you can um, find out about it, uh, make connection to it by uh, emailing hello.network at jvp.org. And I'd like to conclude with some more words from Eliot Botsedek. Uh, words of Torah, all people are chosen. Judaism beyond Zionism means Jews always, yes, but not Jews first. It means giving up ideas of Jewish chosenness, Jewish exceptionalism, Jewish supremacy, Jewish victimhood as absolution from blame. Judaism beyond Zionism means we will never sacrifice other people's lives for our own sense of safety. Judaism beyond Zionism births a dream of a world where no one is a stranger and reminds us we are obligated to do our part to bring that world closer to our own. Judaism beyond Zionism means we honor that our strength and our livelihood are the communities we build and the stories we carry from past to future. It means that our destiny is arguing over our stories, not over boundaries. Judaism beyond Zionism means that all people are chosen and all land is holy. And I would add, all of us are here to build a future that embodies all of this. Samantha. Wow. Thank you all so, so, so much. 
Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Grant. Thank you to Lori, who, who couldn't be here with us tonight, but who, like Jessica said, did so much to put this together. Um, and again, I, I hope you'll join us for the rest of the series, jvp.org slash spotlight. Um, and I think this is just illuminated for me just how uh, hungry we are for these conversations and, and uh, we need to do more of this. So um, you bet your bottom dollar there will be more of this. Um, and uh, I put the email addresses that Linda just mentioned in the chat, so you should find them in there. I'll, I'll paste them again. And this has been recorded, so I will share it out with people who registered for the series. Most likely it'll come when we send out the next email about the next um, phase of the series, so just hang tight. But if you need it earlier for some reason, shoot me an email and I can get it to you, Samantha dot, or Samantha at jvp.org. Um, thank you again. You're all so wonderful. Have a great night.